Hi everyone, this is Professor Hai Nguyen once again. Um, I wanna welcome you back to the second half of this week's lecture as we continue to progress in our journey looking at um, examining uh, African-Americans' quest uh, for their civil rights in the 20th century. So I wanna bring you back to where we left off. Um, hang on one second here, guys. I'm pull up my computer here. All right, I wanna bring you back where we left off looking at, um, yeah, looking at Marcus Garvey, right? And the United Negro Improvement Association. Um, I made the argument that Marcus Garvey and the UNIA was the embodiment, uh, a representation of that uh, new sense of black consciousness in the 1920s, a powerful cultural expression, but also a counteract to the rise of white supremacy and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan as an organization through the, through the 1920s, right? It's kind of, uh, I'm gonna make an argument, it's kind of like fighting, fighting fire with fire, right? Because if you look at um, the United Negro Improvement Association and Marcus Garvey, you can make an argument that basically he's kind of on the opposite end of what the Ku Klux Klan represents, right? The Ku Klux Klan represent basically the opposite in terms of what Marcus Garvey and the UNIA represents, but in terms of what they represent for their people, you kind of think, I mean, it, they're very similar, right? The Ku Klux Klan uh, represents uh, white supremacy, makes an argument that white people are superior, and, and they, they try to portray themselves as defender of American values, right? American tra traditions, and they have uniforms, they have organizations, right? They're marching down in Washington, D.C., and the emphasis is on the community, right? Uh, coming together and uh, fighting against uh, the negative influences of foreigners, Catholic, Jews, Blacks, Asians, and Mexicans, okay? Whereas Marcus Garvey and the UNIA, you can make an argument, uh, look, uh, it's quite the opposite, right? Instead of white, he's talking about blacks, right? Uh, he's talking about black power instead of white power, right? And there is a sense that, again, it's about instilling power, right? uh, empowering African Americans to express themselves, but also to invest in themselves and believe in themselves and ultimately uplift themselves, right? And if you look at it, he, really no different, right? That, that he has his own organization. I mean, hell, they even have parades, they have uniform, they're an expression of black power, and they're talking about the restoration of black civilization and black nationalism. So if you look at it, yeah, they're, they're like these extreme ideologies, but on completely different end, right? Whereas the Ku Klux Klan is talking about separation from black people, the UNA is making the same argument that it's white America that we need to separate ourselves from. And this is gonna be the reason why um, Marcus Garvey is going to become such a powerful voice for African Americans in the 1920s, but he's also not gonna be very well liked by other African American leaders, such as W.E.B. Du Bois, because again, W.E.B. Du Bois is making an argument that it's America that is the home for African Americans, right? They don't know jack sh about Africa. And then on top of that, you have um, W.E.B. Du Bois still holding on to this argument that African Americans need to fight for their rights and that African Americans, the solution to America's race problem is still integration or at least cohabitation or coexistence. You have A. Philip Randolph, who is the leader of um, the largest black labor union in America, he's making an argument that, that it's not just America, it's not that America has a race problem, but America has somewhat of a greed problem in the sense that poverty and, and um, lack to access to education and healthcare and so forth, it, it's not just a, a race problem, but it's more of a class struggle, if you will. Um, I do want to make a note that A. Philip Randolph is a socialist, borderlining communist, if you will, right? And he really believes in the worker struggle. And he believes that it's not just black people who are poor in America, but it's also white people as well who are poor in America. And as a result, it's not just a race problem, but it's also a, a structural flaw within the capitalist system, 
right? And again, I do want to emphasize it, he is somewhat a socialist slash communist. So, uh, but um, for a Philip Randolph, the solution should still be, it's about America, it's about uh, claiming our right to live here, but also the solution is also integration as well. Whereas Marcus Garvey, yeah, he's not, he's, he, he lost hopes in terms of the idea of integration as a solution. He sees separation more as a solution to uh, help African Americans and um, in their somewhat uh, conditions, if you will. So how does that compare to the women's suffrage movement? If you look at it, um, it shows division, right? It shows division that, that again, African Americans are not monolithic, right? They, they differ in terms of their strategies. And so they're different. They are divided, right? But here, what you also have is not so much a, it, it is a, also a division in strategy, right? It, uh, women, they differ in terms of strategy. Uh, should we focus on the state level? Should we focus on the federal level? Whereas you have African-Americans, I mean, guys, they disagree in terms of ideology, right? Like, like at the end of the day, it's not a matter of should we focus on state government or should we focus on Washington, D.C., but this is a matter of how do you want to deal with white people, right? It's a matter of do, do you want to live next to them? Do you want to integrate with them? Or maybe it's better off that we separate ourselves from them. Because again, Marcus Garvey is going to make an argument. I mean, there was a point where Marcus Garvey, he had a meeting with the Ku Klux Klan. He kind of wanted to know, like, what's your beef? Like, what is your problem with African-Americans and the Ku Klux Klan sort of says, well, you know, here are our list of grievances towards you people, right? And he's like, what do you mean, uh, uh, you people? But, um, but after the meeting, it, yeah, Marcus Garvey sort of says, well, at least I know where they stand, right? At least I know where they stand. So that way I can, I can try to navigate, right? And understand how white America works. Uh, um, so uh, this is the reason why Marcus Garvey, he's going to be in a lot of trouble um, well, he's, he's not going to be very well liked by other African American leaders, but he's also going to catch the attention uh, of the FBI in particular, because by the 1920s, there is no other man that is more dangerous to American society, maybe because he represents black power and he speaks for black America and he's trying to tell them to stand up for themselves and help themselves and stand up against racism. This is gonna be the reason why the FBI is going to target um, Marcus Garvey as they are going to label him as the most dangerous person in America, even though what he represents, it's, it's really not that radical, right? He's not talking about overthrowing the capitalist system, right? He's not talking about socialism or communism. I mean, guys, he's not even talking about a different religion. He still clicks to, he still cling on to Christianity as, as somewhat, uh, uh, um, uh, as a, a, a religion that African-Americans subscribe to. And also, what is he telling African-Americans? Go work and support black businesses. But yet, that is gonna be the reason why he is going to become America's most dangerous man in the 1920s, according to the FBI. It's simply because of his, number one, his large following. Number two, of his refusal to somewhat comply to somewhat or accommodate to white America. Uh, and as a result, um, by the late 1920s, the, uh, the UNIA really gets dismantled by the FBI because they ultimately go through somewhat um, the financial records and um, they are going to somewhat um, throw a case at, at uh, Marcus Garvey and deport him. So it's a really sad story what ends up happening to Marcus Garvey, but guys, the legacy of Marcus Garvey is undeniable within American history was that, again, Marcus Garvey is going to have a large following and his imprint, uh, his imprint on the civil rights movement, uh, especially in the later stage of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, is incredibly hard to deny because, again, Malcolm X, right, Stokely Carmichael, SNCC, CORE, some of the most radical, um, you got Black Panther Party, really celebrating Marcus Garvey for what he represents. If not celebrating Marcus Garvey, at least embracing or adopting his ideology, right? This idea of separation, right? This idea of black power, this idea of linking the struggle of black America 
in America to the struggle of those overseas, right? So this idea of human rights and ultimately the connection between Africa and those on the American continent, again, it's really hard to deny the imprint that Marcus Garvey had uh, on the African-American community, but we got to move forward here. So I want to talk about African-Americans in the 1920s. Unfortunately, some of the gains that African-Americans made during the 1920s, unfortunately, um, is going to be wiped out because of the Great Depression itself. Because what you have during the 1930s is that once the economy collapsed, of course, um, we need scapegoats, guys. Um, and those scapegoats are uh, women, uh, Mexicans, uh, Filipinos, and of course, um, African Americans, okay? The saying within the African American community during the 1930s was basically first to get fired and the last to get hired. Because again, it's a zero sum game. That's how the policymakers look at the economy is that if African Americans have a job, right, it takes, it deprives somewhat their white counterparts of a job. And as a result, if you get rid of African Americans, that will open up doors and opportunities for white Americans to somewhat go to work. And that's precisely what you have during the 19th. 30s. You have African Americans being laid off. You have African Americans being excluded from labor unions. You also have African Americans, uh, unfortunately, being collateral somewhat damaged when it comes to somewhat uh, the New Deal policies in the 1930s. That is not to say that FDR was a racist or anything like that. No, FDR, he sympathized with African Americans, but he was also a pragmatist, a realist, meaning that he understand the rules of the game in terms of politics, because in politics, you have to somewhat give in order, for, uh, in order for you to receive. And as a result, during the 1930s, um, a large segment of the Democratic Party was very racist because a lot of Southerners were part of the Democratic Party. And as a result, in the 1930s, we have what we call the Southern veto. These are Southern Democrats in the South that did not want FDR to interrupt with segregation or Jim Crow, okay? And they also did not want African Americans to ultimately benefit from the New Deal welfare measures, right? Work programs, right? And also uh, um, financial assistance in terms of relief. Um, and as a result, uh, I'll give you two prime example. Um, the AAA, right? The AAA, I'm not talking about the, the car towing company. I'm talking about the Agricultural Adjustment Act. So the AAA, it was designed to stabilize prices within somewhat agriculture. The problem that you have in agriculture was that you simply had too much food, you had too much crop, and what it does is that it devalues or somewhat the value of the crop is lessened. So what the AAA did was in order to stabilize prices, if you will, they were subsidizing agriculture by paying farmers not to farm, which is ironic because in the 1930s, hunger and uh, somewhat poverty and starvation was a major problem. So instead of redistributing the food and allowing people to survive, you basically have a government paying farmers to burn their crops during a time of hunger and poverty. So this somewhat leads to the argument uh, uh, against capitalism that it's a greedy system. Uh, it's simply because it's about profits at the end of the day. But make a long story short. So by subsidizing the farmers, by paying them not to farm, well, that means you don't need as many field hands as you need as, as, uh, during normal times. So what do you have? African Americans being kicked off the land. So here's a image of African American sharecroppers, yeah, being booted off of the land that they had somewhat worked on. Um, so they lost their jobs. Uh, again, labor unions excluded African Americans from joining because of well, racism. Uh, and then you have social programs, uh, work programs. Uh, minimum wage did not apply to agriculture, which predominantly is worked by African Americans. You also have social security um, not applying to African Americans as well, or at least to a large number of African Americans because social security and minimum wage did not apply to two industries, agriculture 
and domesticity. And that was my design, guys, because why? They knew that majority of those workers in those fields were African Americans, and that's the power of the Southern veto, right? As a way to suppress labor, right? As a way to keep African Americans in their place, right? Uh, you have those somewhat limitations even within somewhat the New Deal itself. And it's ironically that one of the most progressive president, one of the most liberal president in American history, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, is also going to be responsible for somewhat very racist and discriminatory housing policies as well. Um, 1933, you have the Federal Housing Administration. We'll talk about that a little bit later in terms of redlining and somewhat uh, housing practices. So yes, it's very ironic that it's the Democrats, it's liberals who are going to be responsible for some of the most detrimental policies, uh, um, especially in terms of how it impacts African-American communities. And it is somewhat no different up until today. You can look at the 1990s in particular with Bill Clinton and somewhat the crime bill in 1994 as a way to get tough on crime. Um, one of the unintended consequences of that was mass incarceration. So that's part of the reason why um, there was a lot of backlash against Hillary Clinton when she ran for the presidency in 2016 because again, uh, African-Americans uh, held it against her that it was her husband that was responsible for the mass incarceration of millions of black and brown people as well, right? But make a long story short, 1930s, first to get fired, last to get hired, African-Americans somewhat lose some of the gains that they had made during the 1920s simply because the economy collapsed, right? So let's go to the next one, guys. Okay, all right, so the next one that we have is that, well, what solves America's economic problems is World War II. And once again, very similar story to what happened in World War I. World War II, once again, is going to give African Americans an opportunity to leave the South again, okay? And African Americans, again, during World War II, opportunities in the North, going to work in the factories, going to work in the war industries, you also have African-American press calling on African-Americans to, it's called the double V campaign, guys. This is where you have a uh, black newspaper making an argument that African-Americans should go sign up for the military because that way they can go fight against racism overseas, which were the Nazis, right, in, in, in Germany, in Europe, but also fight against uh, um, the Nazi, uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, fight against racism at home. And again, this validate some of the argument that I made in terms of that debate when we had, should America be the world's policeman? World War II really provided a true opportunity for African Americans to prove their worth. Well, number one, to get the hell out of the South, okay? That's number one. Number two, to fight for their citizenship. Number three, to fight against racism. And it's really World War II that is going to be the watershed moment, meaning the foundational, the, the transformative moment that sort of brings people of color, even white America together under a common cause. And it's really the horrors of the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, where it's really going to force America to have a reckoning with its own uh, racist tendencies, if you will. But African-Americans during World War II, even though they put their lives on the line, fight for their country, and they're able to somewhat escape the South, um, that doesn't mean that things are any better, guys. Um, so I'll, I'll get back to the executive order 9981 in a second. And actually, guys, I apologize for the error. I keep messing this up. That's, that's supposed to be 1948, so I apologize. It's supposed to be 1948, not 1958. I apologize for that. I will explain to you somewhat the executive order by Harry Truman in 1948 to desegregate the army uh, uh, because of World War II, um, because after World War II. Um, but again, just a friendly reminder that just because you get to leave the South doesn't mean that things are better in the North. Are there better opportunities? Yes. Are there more jobs? Yes. But the problem is a familiar theme, guys. Black power, black success, okay, comes white resentment and white backlash. 
This is what happened once again in 1943. It's another race riot, guys. This time, it's, in, it's not in the South. It's not in Tulsa, okay? This time, it is in Detroit, okay? Why Detroit? Because Detroit, in the 1940s, is going to receive an influx of African Americans, okay, from the South, okay, looking for work in the war industry because Detroit was the manufacturing center, right, during World War II. This is where they were making tanks, airplanes, bombs, right? That was the capital of America's arsenal for democracy. So you have an influx of African Americans coming into what used to be a white working class neighborhood. And the problem that you have now is white and blacks are competing for jobs together, right? And as a result, this is going to lead to resentment, right? Competition will lead to resentment and resentment is going to lead to violence. Uh, it starts off very innocent. You have a very hot day in the middle of the summer in 1943. And um, at this somewhat beach in particular, um, you have uh, an African-American, I guess he swam to the wrong side of the beach. He went to the white part of the beach. And then um, the white beachgoers, they started throwing stones at him, right? So they basically stoned him to death. And as a result, African-Americans, they become very upset. Both sides, rumor spreads um, within the black side of Detroit, rumor spreads that African-Americans were being lynched off of the bridge. On the white side of Detroit, you have rumors that there were African-American men, I think you can already guess it, running around raping white women, okay? So as a result, you have this somewhat false news being spread around both sides of uh, 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 Detroit, and then all hell breaks loose. In summer of 1943, as both black and white Detroiters confront one another, and ultimately you have this deadly race riots. And unfortunately, in this story, the police, um, instead of somewhat trying to break up somewhat the riot or somewhat uh, 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 promoting safety and peace, um, unfortunately, some of the police, they, they sort of join in and um, they kill uh, uh, African Americans. Um, because if you look at the autopsy, the 25 out of the 34 people dead, 25 of them were black. And out of that 25, I believe 17 of them, the autopsy shows that the bullet wound that they had suffered, okay, came not from the front, but actually from the back. Why is that important? It's important because what that means is that these were not aggressors. They're not rioters these African-Americans victims were running away because of what they were seeing. And as they were running away, the cops shot them. That's why it's important to understand where the bullet wound came from, because if it's coming from your backside, that means that you had your back turns toward the police officer and they shot you somewhat uh, as you were running away. And things got really uh, violent and deadly that um, they had to call in the army more than 6,000 troops had to be called in. They had tanks rolling through the street of Detroit, and uh, it got really ugly. 700 people were reportedly injured. Damages occur all around $2 million in property damages. Why am I telling you about the Detroit race riot? Because again, it's proof that the grass is not greener on the other side that Northerners do not welcome African-Americans into their neighborhood. Because if you look at the statistics, by 1943, the black population in the city of Detroit had grown to more than 200,000. And just in that year alone in 1943, an additional 50,000 African-Americans had made their way into the city of Detroit. And because of this deadly race riot, the city of Detroit uh, especially the policymakers, the politicians, what they're going to try to do is they're going to try to separate black and white residents apart from each other, literally and somewhat physically. You are literally going to have walls going up throughout the city of Detroit as a way to separate black and white people apart from another. So we'll talk a little bit about the eight mile wall 
that separates black and white resident. And that was a requirement um, from local and also federal government as well, right? So it's another example of somewhat um, black communities being harassed, being terrorized, right? Uh, uh, simply because um, they were encroaching upon uh, white communities in particular. It's a preview of the violence that you are going to see in future somewhat uh, riots in particular. But what separates the Detroit race riot in 1943 and the Tulsa riot in uh, 1921 compared to the race riots, uh, the urban riots that are going to happen in the 1960s is that you can make an argument, Detroit, Tulsa, those were instigated by whites themselves, okay? And that simply African Americans were defending themselves, right, against somewhat uh, uh, white vigilante justice, uh, as I like to call it. The difference is in the 1960s, the urban riots um, is going to root itself within the black community itself. And this is where we want to shift gears. And this is where I want you to think about what were the responses left for African Americans to use as a way to somewhat achieve equality, right? Because we have looked at what accommodation, we have looked at African American using the legal system, African American organizing, right, in, in, in organizations, right, African Americans leaving the South, going into the North, African Americans joining the military, okay? But yet, what do they have to show for it, okay? And that gets to somewhat the mid 20th century. Despite more than half a century, of organizing, uh, of uh, leaving, of joining the military, right? Of accommodating, putting their life on the line during World War II, fighting for democracy. What did African-Americans have to show for all of their somewhat um, efforts? Once, millions of African-American veterans come home from World War II. They were promised that things were gonna be better, that they were fighting for freedom, the four freedoms, right? Um, democracy, equality, freedom. But yet once they came home in the 1950s, it seems like things were still the same that segregation was still the law of the land, especially in the South. Things haven't really improved. Nothing has really changed. Okay? That Jim Crow facilities continues to haunt and segregate right? and instill a sense of second-class citizens among African-Americans. So here you have movie theaters, um, restaurant diners, uh, restroom stops along the freeway, and also laundry mats, all serving, uh, all segregated um, in the South, Jim Crow facilities. Um, if you look at this image, right, this is the iconic um, Jim Crow water fountain. Now, maybe some of you are like, you know what, Professor Nguyen, that ain't the only way to somewhat quench the thirst, right? Um, it's not just water. What about maybe a soda, a nice, cold, refreshing soda in the South? Well, where did Coca-Cola, do you guys know where the, head, the headquarter of Coca-Cola is? Atlanta, Georgia, guys, right? This is the only reason why I only drink Pepsi, guys. Uh, that's right. That's right. I'm, I'm about social justice. That's right. Coca-Cola. Right? I'm not about that because, again, because of its long racist history of dis discriminating against black customers in particular, downright to the sodas that you have right, in the South. And the suppression of the African-American vote continues that you have violence, right? continues to be a way to keep African-Americans from the polls. Now, even when African-Americans voted, and even when, they're voted, even when their votes matter, especially in 1948, okay, Harry Truman 
somewhat gave an impression that he was going to fight for African Americans and their rights, right? For their civil rights in 1958, uh, 1948. And because of the black vote in 1948, because of the black vote, Harry Truman becomes the president of America. And once Harry Truman becomes the president of America, African Americans are thinking, well, you know, he said he was gonna fight for our civil rights, but once Harry Truman becomes the president, he somewhat has to tone down his argument for larger government, for housing, for education, right? For jobs, it's simply because it's in the era of the Cold War, guys. So when you're making an argument for expansion of government power, well, for some people, that sounds a lot like communism. And during the Cold War, which Harry Truman was somewhat the first president to respond to communism, um, he had to kind of tone it down. So it's once again, African-Americans are somewhat left vulnerable. They feel disillusioned. They are somewhat, uh, they feel betrayed, right? Because again, you know, they voted. And even though their vote, I believe it was 70,000 votes, it was a very close election, that the 70,000 votes that African-Americans casted single-handedly gave Harry Truman a victory. A, a, a last minute victory because the newspaper had projected that um, his opponent was going to win. But the fact that they didn't account for the black vote, that's why Harry Truman became the president. But even though Harry Truman becomes the president, he doesn't really make, in terms of large progress, in terms of some of the demands that African Americans were making, he doesn't somewhat try to dismantle Jim Crow. He, uh, uh, he doesn't really somewhat fight on the behalf of African Americans in terms of housing, in terms of education, but he did do one thing, okay? Harry Truman passed the executive order I mentioned to you earlier, okay? Uh, uh, executive order 9981, okay? 9981. And that executive order, what it did was that it desegregated the army, right? Now, why is that important for us to understand? Is it progress? It is. But it just seems like with every step forward, it's two steps back. Because if you look at the executive order of 9981, it only impacts about 10% of the Black population. And it only applies to those in the Army. Okay? Okay, so now I get to serve with somewhat white people, you know, white soldiers side by side. Okay, so what? Does that mean that my relatives at home are treated any better? And then on top of that, African-American soldiers, even though they serve in the military, they serve for their country, when they come home, they are not celebrated by white America. They are still spit upon. And in the South, if you dare to wear your uniform out in public, that was what they describe as acting as uppity. Okay, you're not playing your role here, right? You're getting too big. Right? So you have African-American soldiers being spat upon, being hated upon, some even killed. Okay? Progress, but what does the reality tell you? So they, try, they, they, put, they serve in the military, they put their life on the line, still not enough. They come home, Jim Crow is still the law of the land, even when they vote, right? The politician that they voted for, even though he's in office, betrays them or at least uh, diminishes their value, right? Or doesn't fulfill what he promised them that he was going to do. So what are some other options that African-Americans have here in order for them to achieve equality? And meanwhile, even though you have this executive order, this is what life is like for the other 90% of African Americans who were not in the military. Jim Crow is still the law of the land. So here you have pictures, right, that shows the disparity between white schools and black schools. I think you can already figure out which school is which, okay? Separate, but we know that it was not equal. This was still the law of the land, okay? So, what would you do if you're African-Americans? What are your 
options here in terms of how to fight Jim Crow. The military, right? voting, or you can use, again, you can sue, right? This is why I say the NAACP, this was a huge victory for the NAACP, Brown versus Board. This is one of the most iconic, one of the most somewhat uh, uh, celebrated uh, Supreme Court decisions in the 20th century, Brown versus Board. This was the Supreme Court that desegregated American schools, that it banned segregation in public school, Brown versus Board. So this is the famous case where you have Oliver Brown, he had his daughter, his daughter had to walk three miles across train tracks, many dangerous roads just for her to get to her black school. Meanwhile, the white school was literally right down the block from our home. So the NAACP, they sue. They sue under the premise of the 14th Amendment of equal protection and also equal access. That segregation in public schools Right? Not only was it discriminatory, but it instilled, it, it had a detrimental psychological impact upon their black students. It instilled a sense of inferiority. Okay? So the NAACP, they sue, they use the 14th Amendment of equal protection, and guys, they won. All right? They won. This was proclaimed to be the second proclamation of emancipation in america if you remember the first proclamation that was to free the slaves like that's how big of a victory it was but here lies the problem with somewhat this victory it's a hollow victory in this sense okay you have nine supreme court justices ruling in your favor so what right so what because whose authority is it to enforce this decision Hey, it's one thing to say, yeah, Southern schools, you got to desegregate. But what makes you think Southern schools are going to desegregate on their own? They're not. You're going to have resistance, right? You're going to have white parents coming out, right? Talking about how this is somewhat uh, uh, robbing them of their freedom, of their choice to send their kids to school, that race, uh, race mixing is communism just because you have black kids going with white kids to school. It's communism. Okay, you have Southern governors, right? Oh, uh, uh, Arkansas, Alabama refusing to desegregate their schools. Meanwhile, you have a president, President Dwight Eisenhower. He doesn't believe that, that he needed to do, he needed to somewhat get involved because he thought that, what, that Southern politicians, I mean, uh, Southerners would have what I call moral persuasion. Okay, they're just gonna do it on their own, right? It's, it's in the good heart, right? They're gonna follow the law, okay? Because why, you have the Supreme Court, Brown versus Board, you gotta desegregate the schools. And what Dwight Eisenhower was hoping was that Southerners are going to comply on their own. He's wrong. They're not gonna comply. You're gonna have governors throughout the South shutting down the schools to ban African-American students to even go to white schools. You're gonna have governors sending in the military, the National Guard to block African-American students from going to white schools. This is where you have the famous um, Central High, right? The famous Central High, uh, 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 the Central Nine, I'm sorry, the Central Nine. These are the nine African-American students in um, Little Rock, Arkansas uh, at Central High. And ultimately um, they were ordered to go to this school as part of the desegregation order. But the governor, he decided to refuse, right? He called in the, the National Guard and then things got really messy. So here you can see clearly resistance from white Southerners. So the question become is, why did Eisenhower feel he needed to get involved? This is why if you are a person of color, guys, um, you need to send a fruit basket to Moscow. Because if it wasn't for the communists, if it wasn't for the Soviets, there might not have been scrutiny upon American segregation. 
Because why? You got to put it in the context of the Cold War. America is in this ideological battle between America and the Russians. It's capitalism against communism. It's freedom against totalitarianism. But yet, in America, as America was trying to win the hearts and minds of people all around the world in Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Latin America, here you have back in America, people of color being unable to somewhat live that American dream of going to school, getting their education. And the Soviets, they were quick to call America out on its hypocrisy and its bullshit. And this is what you have propaganda. And it was only through Soviet propaganda that started to put pressure on the White House to intervene on the behalf of African Americans to desegregate Southern schools. And this idea of Soviet propaganda, right, to call America out on his hypocrisy, guys, this has been happening since day number one, since the founding of somewhat the Soviets. The Soviets have always used, right, America's racial problems as a way to highlight the hypocrisy that how can you have in the land of the free African Americans being lynched and killed. So here are some propaganda posters, right, from the Soviets um, dating back to the 1930s with the lynchings of African Americans and also going to the 1960s with the killing of African Americans in the inner cities, right? And the one that you see to the left, it reads shame to America for what it's doing to African Americans. So yes, guys, it's really Soviet propaganda that really forced Dwight Eisenhower to take action to desegregate Southern schools. And that is why in 1957, Dwight Eisenhower, he had to send in the military as a way to escort uh, um, uh, the Central Nine students for them to go to school. And even though they were protected by the military to allow them to go to school, that doesn't mean that they were not hated upon by their classmates. So it's a brutal story. And it's a really sad story because a year later, guys, they shut down the freaking school. <laughs> so instead of... Uh, instead of integrating, Southerners just decided to say, you know what, just shut the whole thing down. So they shut down Southern schools, and what did they decide to do? They decided to open up these things called white academies or private schools, and they tried to disguise it under the veil of Christianity. Oh, these are private religious schools, so as a result, it doesn't have to play by the rules since the parents pay for tuition. And you think about the type of parents who are able to pay for tuition, I think you can already guess that it's white parents. So yeah, it's a really sad story, guys, that uh, a lot of somewhat the private schools in the South today um, actually comes from somewhat a very racist origin, that it was a response to the federal government to force local schools in the South to desegregate. So instead of desegregating, they just decided like, you know what, we're just, we're just gonna shut down the schools. Now, if you look at it, Here's the success rate in terms of Brown versus Board. So from 1954 to 1960, only 7% of Southern schools were desegregated. 7%, that's it. So if you do the math, okay, 7%. You do the math, six years, 7%. How long would African Americans have to wait until their children can go to white schools at that rate? Oh, let me do the math for you. This is the perk of taking an Asian somewhat professor, guys. All right, I can say that. You can't say that. If you're not Asian, guys, that would be racist, okay? Let me do the math for you. It would probably take another freaking century in order for America to integrate Southern schools. So what do you do? Once again, I'm going to ask you somewhat the question. Once again, what options do African Americans have here? in order for them to somewhat achieve equality, right? They already moved out of the South, but that doesn't mean that the North welcomes them, okay? They go to work, right, in the war industries, but they get hated upon because they're viewed as competition. 
They put their life on the line in the military, but they come home and they're spatted upon, okay? Um, you have African-Americans suing, uh, I'm sorry, African-Americans voting, but their politicians turn their back on them. You have African-Americans suing, but the law is not in force. So what are you supposed to do here if you're African-Americans, okay? And the point that I'm trying to build up to is when we look at the urban riots in the 1960s, guys, and also the 1990s and even in 2015, I think it's easy to look at African-American communities and say, well, that seems kind of dumb, right? That you're just marching out in the street and you're just burning up your own city. Like that, that seems counterproductive, right? But we never ask ourselves, what other legal means are there for African-Americans to achieve equality, okay? in spite of their frustration, right? We never ask ourselves that. We always look at the TV and say, well, you know, they're just burning up the streets. They're burning up their neighborhood, right? They're vandalizing. But we never ask ourselves, why? Why are African-Americans marching in the street, protesting, but also rioting, right? We never ask ourselves that. And, and, urban riots in the 1960s, 1990s, and the 2010s is an expression of black frustration. Because what else is there for them to do in the legal means? Because they have exhausted every single source, but yet it seems like it's back to square one. So here you have Brown versus Board, they sue. And what do Southerners do? They shut down the fucking schools, <laughs> right? 1960, only 7% of Southern schools are desegregated. So what other strategy can you use? Ah, this is where we get somewhat the boycott strategy, right? Um, Montgomery, uh, 1957, if I'm not mistaken, okay? Of course, this is a famous story. Rosa Parks, right? She gets on a bus, refused to give up her seat, okay? She gets arrested. She becomes somewhat credited for being the mother of the civil rights movement, even though there were plenty of other women before her that did the same thing, but yet they were not, but that's another story, guys. But fine, we'll, we'll go with the easy, lazy narrative that Rosa Parks, like because of somewhat uh, her uh, heroism, refused to give up the bus, uh, the, her seat, she becomes somewhat the, the hero, right? The Montgomery bus boycott, 1956. Now you have to ask yourself, why did the bus boycott succeed? The bus boycott in Montgomery succeed because African-Americans came together. They helped out one another. They organized bus ride, they organized carpools. Some of them just simply walk with their feet as a way to put pressure on the local bus line to desegregate. But by boycotting, what are they doing? They're using their power as consumers as a way to put pressure on a business, right, to comply. Now, that boy, that, look, that boycott strategy, it worked to a certain extent. It worked in Montgomery, because why? In Montgomery, you have African-Americans coming together, but you think about this, guys. This boycott la lasted more than a year a year, right? Can you imagine today, like, let's say, like, you know, your neighborhood, your community is disfranchised and you decided, you know what? I'm gonna boycott by not driving my car, right? Can you imagine like not driving your car? What a inconvenience that would be. But by not driving your car, right? You're, you're using your power, right, to boycott the car manufacturer or whatever you want to call it, right? Like well, let's say Ford or Chevy, right? They come out with some racist ads that upset you so much and you decided, you know what? I'm not going to drive my Chevy anymore. I'm just going to walk. Can you imagine what an inconvenience that would be for an entire year that you didn't have a car? That's how this was, right? That they didn't have the bus, but it worked. A year, it worked, but the problem was it took them a year. Number two, it also took cooperation. Number three, you also needed the right heroes. Rosa Park, clean, pristine, right? Not a baby mama, <laughs> right? Unlike the other women that got caught before her, ended up she was pregnant with another man's baby, okay? So uh, member NAACP, 
right? Happily married, right? Clean record. Martin Luther King, he comes in and he is somewhat the symbol of the protest in Montgomery. Middle class, Christian, right? So you needed the right leaders. But here lies the problem. There's, there's a limit to this strategy, guys. And what is the limit to this strategy? Boycott. Let me ask you, how do you boycott a business that does not want your business? Okay, because you can do this to the bus line because they rely on your business. So you can use your power as a consumer, right? To force the company to comply. But what about those restaurants? What about the laundromat that did not serve African-Americans? How do you boycott them, right? Let's say, for example, a lunch counter that does not serve African-Americans. How do you boycott right, when they don't want your money? Do you see the structural flaw in that? Okay, And with every flaw, with, with every limitation, there comes evolution. Okay, Because why? Brown versus Board desegregate the schools. It uh, doesn't seem like the government is making much progress. Right? So there's a flaw right there, okay? And then here you have another evolution, right? Using our power as consumers to put pressure on the bus line to desegregate, but it only works to a certain extent, guys. And this is where you get the sit-in movement, okay? This is where you get the sit-in movement, okay? Let's take the fight to those white establishment by using act of civil disobedience, nonviolence, Right? So what are we going to do? These four guys right here, right? These four uh, uh, African-American activists, 1960, right? This is at the Woolsworth lunch counter. They walk in and what do they do? They just sit there. Is that something? They just sit there. They're going to wait until they get served. First day, they don't get served. They are asked to leave. Okay. They just sit there. They leave. They come back the next day. Once again, same thing, right? They're asked to leave. They continue to sit. They continue to sit. Next day, come back again. Do the same thing over, except this time, bring more friends. Bring more people, all right? Strength in numbers, I guess, okay? So here you have the sit-in movement. This thing becomes contagious, guys, because why? It's very simple. Doesn't really take much planning. I mean, all you really have to do is identify a business and just put your body on the line. That's it have a little bit of courage. And this is why we celebrate the civil rights movement, guys, because you don't understand what these people were willing to put on the line. Their own body, their own lives, not only just themselves, but also their family members as well, right? But the sit-in movement itself, yeah, th th this thing becomes contagious throughout America. This was the official moment where the civil rights movement become a national movement, guys, okay? Because why? You don't hear of the Atlanta bus boycott, do you? You don't hear of the Memphis bus boycott, do you? You only hear of the Montgomery bus boycott, okay? But the sit-ins, this was a nationwide movement. And surprisingly, it came from a very somewhat um, unexpected place. <laughs> young people, who would have thought, right? Young people would be capable of pushing for change. Okay, but this was the generation, guys, right? These were the baby boomers coming into age and they believe in the mantra of freedom, equality. And what's that famous saying from JFK, right? Ask not what you can, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. It's a sense of activism. There's a sense of empowerment that young people in America could push for change. And that's the sit-in movement, right? You got 70,000 people across America, 100 cities, 20 states. And what are they doing? Lunch counters, libraries, movies, churches, beaches, swimming pools, right? Restaurants, diners, shopping malls, right? You name it, African-Americans and also white liberals, they join into, okay? They showed out. Strength in numbers, right? Using their bodies, act of civil disobedience, right? To fight against segregation. Taking the fight 
to the white establishment. And this is where you are going to have the formation of young activist groups like SNCC, which stands for the Student for Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or its nickname SNCC, okay? And also the revival of a organization that popped up during World War II, CORE, the Congress on Racial Equality, CORE, gets revived, but it's mostly led by college students, okay? So they put their bodies on the line, right? They are somewhat uh, showing out uh, in the sit-in movement. And this is where we get to the apex of the civil rights movement, right? You got more than a quarter of a million people showing up to Washington, D.C. to protest against segregation. They are trying to put pressure on Congress to pass a civil rights bill that would ensure and ban segregation throughout the land. Okay. I'm sorry, that would ban. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I seem to contradict myself there. I said ensure and ban. No, it's to make sure that the civil rights bill that was being proposed in Congress would ban segregation throughout America. So they show up to Washington, D.C. But even in Washington, D.C., you can see splinters. You can see division among the major organizations, right? Very similar to the women's suffrage movement. Right, between the National Association for the Women uh, 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 Suffrage Association right, and also the National Women's Party. African Americans, they're no different because at this demonstration, you have the NAACP that was somewhat known for its conservatism. It only wanted to somewhat fight in the legal system. It thought that Martin Luther King was an agitator. Um, they didn't believe in somewhat marching on the street, kind of gave African Americans a bad look. You also have on the opposite end, young activists, SNCC and CORE, that was a little bit more aggressive, right? More on the offense, okay? They didn't believe in the court system or anything like that. They wanted to take the fight to the white establishment. So the original plan was that they were gonna show up to Washington DC and SNCC and CORE, they wanted to do a lock-in. They wanted to uh, do a human barrier, like a human chain, and lock in Congress until they pass the Civil Rights Bill. And very last minute, you have JFK calling Martin Luther King, the NAACP, and really putting pressure on those leaders to change the plan. So what did the plan ended up? Instead of going to somewhat the Congress building, they went to the Lincoln Memorial, okay? And this is where you have, of course, the iconic speech of I have a dream, Martin Luther King. Yes, we have heard it many, many times, okay? But you can already see that the March in Washington has splinters and cracks, okay? Between the young activists, okay? And some of the older folks, okay? Who still cling on to the idea of the legal strategy. You got Martin Luther King, he's somewhere in between Right? He understands why the young people are, are somewhat frustrated, right? but he's also, he still believes that through Christianity, through nonviolence, he can win the hearts and minds of white America. Now, the March on Washington, I would say it's the apex of the civil rights movement because here you have all of the different groups coming together, united in their cause to put pressure on the federal government to pass the civil rights bill. Okay. Now, the Civil Rights Bill, eventually it does pass, but not because of the March on Washington. It passes because you have, ironically, the assassination of JFK, which really was a shock to Americans at the time. And then on top of that, you have his successor, Lyndon B. Johnson. Ironically, Johnson is from the South. Out of all of the American president, it is a man from Texas that is going to somewhat put pressure and be the reason why the civil rights bill become the law of the land. Because Lyndon Johnson believed that he needed to fulfill the wishes of his predecessor, who was JFK. He was not going to let the death of JFK die in vain. 
he thought that he wanted to fulfill the legacy of JFK by passing the Civil Rights Bill in 1964. And Johnson was an excellent politician. He knew how to push people's buttons. He knew how to use his authority as a way to put pressure on Congress to pass the Civil Rights Bill. But Johnson also knew that once he passed the Civil Rights Bill of 1964, he knew that Southerners were going to turn their back on Congress itself. And this is where, guys, you are going to have the shift in the South. What used to be a strong Democratic voting bloc, the South, those Southern Democrats, or they're called Dixiecrats, who supported segregation, who were racist, but because of the Civil Rights Bill in 1964, this is where you have those white Southern Democrats switching their allegiance to the Republican Party because of their anger and frustration that Lyndon Johnson, a Southerner, a man from Texas, a Democrat, had voted and pushed for the Civil Rights Act of 1965 to ban segregation. And as a result, guys, this is the reason why if you look at Southern states today, they're all Republican. Okay, they're all Republican. And that's the reason why, guys. It's because of Johnson. It's because of the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. The fact that you have a president and Congress interfering in Southern somewhat society. That's when you have the switch. Okay. But at least the task is done. Okay. You have segregation being banned throughout America. So the task is done, right, guys? Equality is at hand, okay? White and black children, right, can walk up the hill, right, clap their hands, rejoice with one another, okay? And maybe somewhat 50 years later, their grandchildren will be caught on Instagram, right, doing the Dougie or I don't know, you know, hit the quan or whatever. I don't know what is the latest somewhat viral dance challenge that, that's out there, right? I think it's what the Tussie challenge or... Well, that's Drake, right? And then two years ago was the Kiki challenge. I mean, all kind of challenge, right? But I think you get the idea here. So is the job done? Okay, so you, you abolish segregation. So now African-Americans can go eat at the same lunch counter as their white counterpart, right? If you guys remember, this is very similar, right? To the women's suffrage movement. When women got the right to vote, American public thought, oh, it's over, right? Women got what they wanted. This is something they've been arguing for years, right? They got the right to vote. And what did women say? They go, no, 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 no. Voting is only the beginning. It's about equality, okay? What the Civil Rights Act in 1964 does is that it allows for equal access in terms of business. Okay, so... I can go eat at the same lunch counter as my white counterpart here. But you got some African Americans saying, if I'm poor and if I don't have a job, I don't have education. And if I can't afford the fucking burger, what the hell does this matter? Okay. So if you notice the slogan for the March on Washington here, it, it, it's not just about freedom, guys. Look at that key word there. What are they fighting for? Jobs. Jobs. Right? Jobs. Housing. Education. So how do you get those things? Right? How do you get white businesses to hire black when they have so much prejudice, so much biases, simply because of history, right? That African-Americans have always been viewed as dangerous, as lazy, as dependent, and guys, sorry, I, I don't think much has changed, right? So now the question becomes, okay, so we can eat at the same lunch counter, so what? It doesn't matter if the burger, if I can get access to the burger, because if I can't, if I don't have a job, 
to pay for the king burger. This, this bill is nothing. And again, here's a structural flaw. How do you get white America to hire black? How do you get white universities to accept blacks? How do you get white bankers and white lenders to give out loans to blacks? Right? All this does, all the civil rights bill does is that it allows African Americans to put in an application, but at the end of the day, who has the authority, guys? Who has the power? Who has the wealth? It's white America. And how does white America view African American historically? And by 1964, guys, with black success, I'm going to repeat it one more time, comes white resentment. Because even though you have such a large demonstration in Washington, D.C., don't forget, guys, there is a silent majority that is fuming and angry at what they are seeing. Okay? And again, in the 1960s, there is still, even though you have the civil rights bill to provide for equal opportunity and equal access, it's kind of like starting a race, right? Like a marathon, which is 26 mile, okay? White people, right, are at the finish, uh, are at the starting line, okay? They got great shoes on, right? They're ready to go running, right? They got their protein bar, right? They got the headband on. Right? They got their, somewhat, uh, their phones with their headphone. It's fully charged. Whereas African-Americans, right, they're still in the parking lot. Right? They don't have sneakers. They don't have running shoes on. They don't have the protein part. Right? They don't have the wireless headphones. That's what Black and white America was in the 1960s. Because if you look at it, Black America still lag behind in terms of life expectancy. They still lag behind in terms of education. They still lag behind in terms of jobs, in terms of wages, okay? Simply because why? Historically, they have been excluded. And just because you opened the door in 1960, that doesn't mean that ultimately overnight, African-Americans are going to catch up, right? There is going to be backlash, resistance, from white America, even though you have the passage of 1964 of the Civil Rights Bill. And again, how do you force white businesses to hire black? Affirmative action. But that's another mechanism that's going to be used in the 1960s as a way for government to incentivize businesses to hire black to give preference to black. But when you do that, okay, white America is up in arms and what are they saying? Reverse discrimination. Affirmative action is reverse discrimination because why? It's about equality, right? Here you're giving black people preference. That's not equality. So how do you solve these inequalities, guys? Right? Because if you don't give African Americans somewhat preference or a leg up, it's kind of like the race, they never catch up to whites. Right? If you don't give them the sneakers, if you don't give them the protein bar, right? If you don't give them water, how do they catch up to that white runner? Right? So basically, you, you're just, it's the same thing. There will always be a gap because as, as much as African Americans are, are moving, white America is still moving ahead. Or sometimes, right, white America is pushing African Americans back further and further along the race by not hiring black, by not excluding African Americans, by crying reverse discrimination, right, by underpaying African American workers simply because of their race. So how do you do that? And by the 1960s, by the end of the, no, actually, you know what, I'm sorry. And if you think about it, guys, okay, so let's talk about desegregation. Okay, so you have the Civil Rights Bill, 1964. It desegregates society, but that applies to the South. You have African Americans in the North, in the West. They have lived in a desegregated society, right? 
You don't have Jim Crow in the North. You don't have Jim Crow in the West. But you look at the reality of African Americans in those regions, they're not doing much better. They've been able to vote. They've been able to go to work, okay? They've been able to live among whites, but yet something was still holding them back from achieving that American dream. That African Americans find themselves in the inner cities, in the North, in the West, still treated as second class citizens, still living in poverty, still segregated. But here's the difference, guys, is that in the North, in the South, it's what we call segregation by practice, not by law. That's in the South, where you have Jim Crow signs everywhere that tells you where to go, right, where to sit, okay? In the North and in the West, it's what we call segregation by practice. It means racism by the choices that you make on a daily basis. Where you live, where you send your kids to go to school, where you go to work, what side of the freeway you, you live on, right? Who you let into your community, who do you keep out, okay? That's gonna be the new challenge. Because this is why guys, starting in 1965 to 1968, every single summer in America, during those years, 1965 to 1968, there is a city somewhere in America that is burning up in flames. These are the urban riots in the 1960s, except this time it's not done by somewhat white Ku Klux Klan member in bed sheets. This time it's coming from black communities. And the question you have to ask yourself is why were African Americans, right, burning up their own community? it seems counterproductive, okay? So here are pictures that you see from the Detroit race riot, uh, urban riot in 1967, okay? They had to call in the National Guard. Once again, right, it's the same story, right? Uh, uh, bringing in the military just to put, uh, just to implement law and order. Before you jump into judgment, you might wanna ask yourself, what other alternative is there for African Americans to fight for housing, jobs, right, education. What is the alternative? Can you go vote for a job? Right? Can you go protest for a job? Can you sue for a job? Right? You think about all, uh, can you boycott for a job? Right? That's the structural flaw, guys. You need to ask yourself because there comes a certain point where you just have exhausted every single means and method available to you, okay? And again, how do black America convince white America to pay higher taxes, right? To help black America build themselves. Right? That's the art. Right? Because at the end of the day, guys, it's a simple game of arithmetic. It's a simple game of zero sum, meaning, right? If I give you something, that means I lose something. That's how taxes work, guys. Okay? People pay taxes and they expect things in return from their government. Okay? So let me ask you this question How do you, ex how do you, ex how do you convince? white Americans in Saratoga, Los Altos, Los Gatos, Atherton, up the peninsula to, to pay higher taxes, to build housing, schools, and provide services for kids in Oakland, right? Hayward, okay? Pittsburgh, okay? Vallejo. You think they'll do that? You think white America will say, yeah, 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 
take more of my money. So that way you can go somewhat build in black communities. Maybe you might have a few individuals who are liberal minded, but overall as a whole, right? If I'm gonna pay taxes, I want something in return. That's gonna help me. Isn't that what we do guys? Yeah. So how do you do this? Okay. And the problem that you have is that the root of the urban riots, it's a structural flaw that exists within the land itself. And this is where housing is so important because what you have starting in the 1930s is that basically the federal government, when it comes to housing, when it comes to somewhat the construction of the American dream, white Americans are put on a fast pass, an accelerated course, an easier course to make their way into the suburbs, into middle-class America, whereas black America is simply excluded from the American dream. So this idea that the American dream, oh, pull yourself up by the bootstrap, just got to work harder. You don't need the federal government to help you in order for you to accomplish the American dream. Guys, that is all full of shit. Yeah, I'm just going to be blunt. It's full of shit. Okay. I'm not saying that hard work is not part of the formula. Of course, you got to work hard. Okay. Of course, you got to go to work. You got to put in your dues, right? But to say that white America did it on its own, that's a lie. Because if you look at middle-class America, the American dreams and the suburbs, right? These homes that you see here, it was all facilitated. It was all subsidized. It was promoted by the federal government. I wanna make that clear. The federal government was instrumental, instrumental, right? In housing construction, in housing lending. Okay, instrumental in terms of the access that millions of white Americans right, made their way to the suburbs. So I will somewhat wrap it here, wrap it up here for today, because again, this is a very complex issue to look at. So when you guys come back next week, all right, we will look at housing segregation and how the government facilitated white flight and also uh, um, the structural flaw within the housing policy that really created black and white America, right? That by 1968, despite the Civil Rights Act, despite the Voting Rights uh, Act of 1965, the Kerner Commission's report stated that despite all of the liberal policies that were passed, it is still clear that there was two America, one black, one white, unequal. And the question is why? And the reason why I ask you to think about your American somewhat dreams in one of the class discussion, it has to do with what we're going to talk about next week, how important housing is and how it somewhat provides the foundation, the capital that you will need in order for you to succeed, but not just you to succeed, also your kids. We're talking about multi-generational wealth here, guys. At the end of the day, the ingredient remains the same in terms of independence and success in America. It's property. So when you guys come back next week, I will explain to you step by step how the federal government facilitated, subsidized, assisted right, to make the American dream possible for some or for many at the expense of some all right it's a zero sum game guys all right so i will see you next week but until then make sure that you're doing your preparation for midterm number two okay if you haven't done so get a get a jump on it guys i would say we're about 80 percent of the way done okay when you guys come back next week i'm gonna wrap up looking at housing policies we're gonna look at the rate uh, at the urban riots and we're gonna try to make it relevant what's happening today i hope that this lecture has been clear to you in terms of how African-Americans have responded to Jim Crow, but also the limits of their 
uh, strategy as well. Okay, guys, have a wonderful week. I will see you next week. Okay, but as always, be safe out there, guys. Thank you very much. Have a great day.